Good morning from Philadelphia. This is Alex from ICTUS International Music Competition, and we have a special guest with us, Phil O'Neill, live from Sydney, Australia, where it's evening. Uh, good morning, Phil. Hey, good afternoon, Alex. How are you going? Well, good evening. Uh, so Phil was a winner in the 2018 ICTUS International Music Competition. He was first prize in the Category 4, ages 26 and up. Um, and this is the first of a, a live series that we're doing interviewing past winners of the competition uh, just to catch up with them and talk about what they're doing now, um, especially during this, the current quarantine situation that we're all in. Um, and so, Phil, if you just want to maybe fill us in on, uh, you, we were talking, you're doing some online teaching and what you're doing currently during the quarantine. Yeah, so, um, yeah, doing a lot of teaching. Um, Luckily, a lot of my students, my private students in the school that I teach at, um, a lot of my students came online. Um, so the students that I've got through through schools, they've come on and we're using Microsoft Teams. And it's been a handy little thing. And I just sit in my little office here and um, work away and teach away and work on my online sort of stuff. And then I've got my, um, I've got a membership program where I teach people how to play trumpet through there as well. And that's mostly done through videos and that kind of thing. Um, and at the moment to make things a bit more interesting, a lot of people have got a bit more time on their hands. We've been working on uh, so essentially a, a weekly micro recital kind of thing. So we work through it and we practice through it Monday to Thursday. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I do a Facebook live as part of the members group. And then on Friday, I do a bit of a live recital kind of vibe straight to YouTube, you know, warts and all. Let's see how it goes kind of thing. And Monday, we start all over again. Fantastic. Fantastic. And you, you before we moved into the current situation where everybody's online, you were running an online uh, teaching, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, at one point, I kind of figured out that being a... Um, being a musician was never going to be uh, a smart business venture and being able to make a decent living off, off trading hours for pay was never going to be an amazing thing. And I kind of got to the point where every student I had is like, you know, for three or four weeks in a row, it's like, no, Timmy E is on one and two. No, 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 no. One and two Timmy. So I figured if I <laughs> videoed that lesson, and then put it onto an online platform, Timmy could go and watch that as many times as he needed to. And by the time he'd watched it three or four times without me having to, to do it, he got to figure out that he was one and two. That's fantastic. That's, that's, actually, that's really fantastic. Uh, I, I sort of find the same thing for some younger students. If you have a recorded video for them um, to warm up with, it really makes a difference just figuring mm. out those basic fundamentals and watching somebody do it. Because when you're playing for one year, you don't really know what you're doing um, mm. until you figure it out. I, maybe, maybe if you've been playing for 20 years, I'm still figuring it out, but <laughs> yeah. Aren't we um, all? Yeah. Uh, so um, let's, let's maybe jump back a little bit uh, and let's maybe start with how old were you when you started trumpet? Ah, uh, that's a bit of a funny story actually. Okay. So, um, I was, I was seven when I first started and I actually started on the tenor horn or the alto horn, as I think you guys in the U S call it. And, uh, my dad, he was, um, he actually conducted the local C grade brass band. Okay. And, um, you know, so he was, he was very passionate about it. And, um, you know, so he, he needed another second horn player cause there weren't enough offbeats in the band at the time. So, you know, there I was seven years old and he goes, here's a, here's a tenor horn get stuck in. Now, the funny thing there was um, my older brother, who's, who's six years older than me, he started on the tenor horn as well. And then when it was time for him to go to high school, he couldn't play the tenor horn at high school. So he actually swapped to trumpet and cornet then. Mm -hmm. And I idolized my older brother. Um, so I actually convinced my younger brother who would start it on cornet at this stage. And it's only like a month or so in. I convinced my younger brother that the tenor horn was a cooler instrument than the cornet <laughs> and convinced him to swap. So he got stuck playing off beats for the rest of his days on the instrument. I got to go play a back row cornet. That's funny. Uh, so you just fell in love with, with the sound of the cornet and wanted to... No, I hated it. Oh, you hated it? Okay. I hated it with a passion. I, um, 
I despised playing an instrument. I hated practice and <laughs> um, my, my childhood, my, my dad was really strict and um, I wasn't allowed to go outside and play. I wasn't allowed to watch TV. I, all of the fun things that we kind of do, I wasn't allowed to do any of them until I'd done my practice. So, you know, so he'd, you know, he'd look at me at some time in the morning and be like, all right, time to do your practice. I'm like, yes, dad. You know, head sagging off, off I'd go and do my practice. And yeah, I, I really disliked it. And um, it wasn't until uh, a number of years later that he, um, sadly, he, he passed away when I'm he was sorry. quite young. Um, and I was still, I was only about 10 at the time. And um, my, when he, when he went to hospital, he spent a lot of time in hospital towards the end. And I remember cheering that he was in hospital because I didn't have to practice. I'm like, yes, he's not here to not see me practice. So, um, you know, it's something I later regret, but um, yeah. And then it was after he died and um, I spent a bit of time at home and my younger brother who he wasn't interested in music, he was right into computers and, the broad, uh, there was a dial up internet had just come out at that stage as well. So the old 256K modem sort of thing. And, you know, just on the windows, like windows 94 or something. I don't know. <laughs> my brother would come home and straight onto the computer, he'd go. And, you know, at the time I really liked cooking and I wasn't allowed to use the stove. So, you know, they counted that out and I didn't like any of the TV. So I actually went digging under my bed and pulled my cornet out and, out of complete boredom, I started, started playing it again. And um, then it, after a while went by, I started to get the competitive kind of challenge going. And my older brother, who I mentioned before, was six years older than me, and I kind of started digging out music that he'd play. And I'd, I'd ask my mum, I was like, how old was my brother when he played this? He's like, oh, he was a bit he was this age. I'm like, right, I'm going to play this and I'm going to play it better than he could. And I'm going to play it younger than he could. And yeah. So that competitive drive really got me engaged in music from there. So it wasn't until I was about 11 or 12 that I actually started enjoying it. Um, up until then it was, it was all forced. I hated it. Okay. It's funny. I, I, I hear a lot of these stories of, of students when they're younger, they mm -hmm. have a parent who just really pushes them. Um, and then yeah. they don't appreciate it until, later in life. I know I had a similar thing with my mom. She wouldn't let me go outside and play basketball or things until I practiced and I hated it as well. Um, yeah. it's, just, it's an amazing story. So then how old were you then? And so you said like around 12 or so you were practicing. So how old were you when you decided this is like what I want to do with my life? Um, yeah, I was about, I was about 13, um, when I decided. And, um, so I saw, the army band play um, mm -hmm. actually. And it was a reserve band because I grew up in Adelaide. Um, There's an army reserve band then at the time. And I just saw them play. And, and there was also the police band, which was full time. And I saw those guys play and I loved what they did. Um, they would play every genre of music. And, you know, as a, as a kid, I was like, man, that's so amazing. They did everything that you could think of musically. And they, they loved what they did. Um, and I also liked the military service kind of vibe as well. Like, um, I was a big fan of, of, of serving. Like my, my dad always wanted to be in the air force band. My, uh, my stepdad was an engineer for the army as well. My granddad served in the air force, um, during world war II. Um, so there was a bit of a connection with the military at that time. And from, yeah, I was 12 or 13 and I was like, yep, that's where I want to go. That's what I want to do. That's fantastic. Mm. Um, and so then, um, did you, did you go, I know you were, you were in the, uh, the, was it the Royal Navy band in Australia? Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I actually, uh, I actually left school early because I got accepted for a course, um, at the Adelaide conservatorium. Um, so I left, um, instead of finishing year 12 at, um, I went to Marrickville high school in South Australia and that's, one of the best music schools um, around, um, arguably probably one of the best going. And it's just a very, very full on and fantastic music program. And, um, but I already knew where I was going and I was very focused that I wanted to do music. And um, the other studies kind of 
got in the way and I saw doing, it's like, I can either do an hour worth of my English assignment or I can do an hour's practice. And when I was hanging the English boots up and not doing as well there as what I should have been committed to and doing well in, in trumpet playing, then when I got this opportunity to go to the conservatorium, I took that. Um, and when I was there, I did an audition for the Army Reserve Band. And the plan was that I was going to work for them um, in the reserve band, which is one night a week sort of thing. And one weekend a month is the vibe. Um, I was going to do that while I was doing my degree. But when I did that audition, they actually offered me a full-time job on the spot, Fantastic. Um, which I took a little bit of time to think about. And, um, you know, cause I was like, well, I should get my degree, but here's the job that I'm wanting to study to get being offered to me. So I took that opportunity when it was there. And so, yeah, 17 years old, I joined the military and I was actually 16 when I did the audition. Um, wow. I was about six weeks before my 17th birthday. So yeah, I'd been at the con for a little while and um, yeah, did my audition for the band, got accepted and then started the recruiting process on my 17th birthday. And yeah, it wasn't too much longer that I was at basic training playing with guns and obstacle courses and stuff like that. Wow. That, that's amazing. Uh, how many years were you, were you in the band there? Yeah. So I did 10 years in the army band. Okay. And then, um, the band, the, um, the role of the army band changed towards the end of my 10 years there. Okay. And it went to, so they, um, they were forced to downsize a lot of numbers. So they had to change from being a, concert band wind ensemble kind of vibe that broke down into um into like a big band and a rock band and a brass quintet and that kind okay. of thing they had to downsize down to where their largest ensemble was a um a big band kind of thing okay and whilst i enjoyed playing in the big band i didn't it wasn't where my heart lied um and because i i kept ending up on lead trumpet playing because i could play the high notes and okay um I just didn't like the way that my chops felt the next day. The next morning is like, Oh, Oh, this is rough. And I hated having to pick myself up every day. <laughs> so there was that. Um, I, I was newly married as well. Okay. And we wanted, so my wife and I wanted a posting back to, um, to Sydney, which is the only posting we could get that was close to either of our families. Um, so that we could start having kids and have that support network. Mm -hmm. Um, but the army wanted to send me to the furthest posting away possible, which was Townsville. Wow. And um, it wasn't really on, on my radar and I didn't really want to do that. And um, fortunately, one of my, my best mates was um, the this, this section leader at the Navy band. And he, I was talking to him and he's, he just said, look, we've got a spot here. Why don't you audition? Um, and I, I was a little bit reluctant to at first, but after a bit of thinking, I was like, look, it's a home posting. It's essentially the same job, just a different uniform. The Navy band got to keep their full wind band. So I got to go straight to a Sydney um, band, which had 45, uh, I think 45 to 50 people at the time. So we got to play wind band music all day, um, which was fantastic. And I, you know, a job that was a little bit more suited to the style of playing that I wanted to do in the end. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, you, you said in the, in the, when you were doing the jazz band, you did only the high notes. Do you, do you improvise as well or? Uh, incredibly badly. Um, <laughs> I gave it a go. Uh, I, um, uh, when I was in the Kapuka Army Band, we had a really talented guitarist who, um, who was very, very good jazz player. And um, I remember for about two years, I was getting fortnightly lessons with him on, okay. on how to actually improvise. And I got to a point where I could get myself around a blues and you know, that kind of thing. And if someone points to me, something's going to come out, but <laughs> as far as me being proud of what's coming out, it, okay. it's, yeah, it's not the case. <laughs> okay. Um, and so what, what, what were maybe some of like your playing highlights uh, there and, and those jobs? Did you play some like big events and. Uh, man, I played at some, epic events um so when um queen elizabeth came here um mm -hmm. a few years ago and um yeah so she came and she came for a um i think it was a changing of 
there's a graduation ceremony, but I think they changed the colors as well. And changing mm. the colors is a big deal. It's a new banner comes in and yeah, it's like a three and a half hour parade. And um, she came to that and there was functions all over the time, all over the place as well. And so like we would literally be on the parade ground from 7.30 in the morning through to 4.30 in the afternoon practicing this parade. It had to be wow. schmick. Like there were, you know, um, there were cameras everywhere. The queen was here. Like this was essentially, this is what the military bands are there for, to look and sound great in a ceremonial thing and it doesn't get a bit any bigger than the queen turning up. So that was pretty epic. Um, and I remember doing, yeah, so we'd come off the parade ground at like four 30 and your feet are just in absolute agony and your chops are like bleeding cause you've been stomping around <laughs> everywhere. And, and then, yeah. And then like, we'd have to go and play at functions that night sort of thing. So, and this, this the opening night to when the queen actually came her first functions like fanfare trumpets we had we're in um we're in canberra and um i think yeah like this function room and like we've got fan like six fanfare trumpets on one side and then six fanfare trumpets on the other side and the conductor's standing down the bottom and we're all having to just watch because there's like doppler effect going on everywhere and you know playing soprano fanfare trumpet after being on the parade ground all day it's uh yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, I also got to spend a bit of time in, in Afghanistan. Um, oh. My auxiliary role when I was in the military band was uh, as an audio engineer. So I got to take some comedians and, and a, a punk rock band that was big in Australia in the 90s. And we got to go on tour through Afghanistan and do it uh, like a tour, uh, forces entertainment tour. So just to try and boost morale through mm. through the Middle East. And that was... Um, that was interesting. I don't think there's many sound guys out there who can say that they've uh, set up a full PA for 2000 people with a weapon on their back and full body armor on as well. <laughs> that was, uh, that was pretty cool as well. But um, I think for me, um, the biggest highlight was um, in, uh, it was, it was in my, it was actually in my last year in the job and I didn't know it was going to be my last year in the job until I, uh, way after this but um my uh it was my first day back um after my son was born i took a bit of long service leave mm -hmm. and like the first day back was anzac day it's like you know, anzac day over here it's it's something you don't miss it's it's the day that everyone in the military stands like you know you stand proud you know you're mm -hmm. really proud of your service and it's, i guess it's like veterans day kind of thing mm -hmm. and um we uh, we had really long days um, for for the band on Anzac Day. We'd do a dawn service in the morning. We'd then go and do a street march, and then we'd go and play at the the rugby, like the rugby league, which is like our football sort of thing. And that wouldn't happen until quite late in the afternoon. So there's a lot of waiting around. But I sounded the last post, which is the the bugle call for that. Um, oh. And I've done done bugle calls at high places before, and um, I got to do it at the Battle of Isharava, which is, um, which was actually won by my wife's unit. Actually, a reserve unit actually won that battle, so that was pretty special on the Kokoda Trek. Um, but standing on that on that football field, and just I just felt like I played really really well, and the emotion behind it, I'd never seen a crowd of fifty thousand people stand silently for the whole minute um like i did there and that that feeling is just um you just can't explain that feeling i'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it now um it's like just that that sorrow for what was what we were remembering yeah that was pretty epic that's probably my biggest highlight from my time in the military that's amazing were you, what, what i mean what were you thinking if there's like fifty thousand people were you, were you scared beforehand or? No, I, I'm not actually. Um, okay. So I guess I've actually got it here. Um, uh, oops. So when you hold the bugle, you hold the bugle in your right hand and like this. And on okay. my right hand, so my father died when I was young. Um, I've actually got my father's wedding ring there. Okay. But whenever I play the last post, I just stand and I'm like, as you can see, I've got my father's wedding ring right there. 
And I guess every time I sound it, I just think of him and how thankful I am that he gave me this gift of music to do what I'm doing. Um, but I guess this is also like being able to sound a good bugle call is something that um, it's the it's the one thing that I can give back to the people who have actually been through through the trenches and the guys who have been through some some absolutely devastating conditions um, mm. that you know I wish no one would ever have to go through. But I guess that's me giving something that I can back to those guys that have been through that. That's amazing, amazing story and amazing about the the ring as well. Mm. Um, really amazing um so i wanted to maybe jump around a little bit uh you you recorded a cd and i forget was that before you did ictus or was that after i think it was before right um that was the one that's currently out i recorded uh, quite a long time before okay um i actually recorded that when i first changed over to the navy band and that was okay. uh 2000 um 2014 i think it was yeah Okay. Um, and that, yeah, that was, that's really special to me, that album. Um, so there's always, as a musician, we're always chasing that euphoria kind of feeling the, you know, we, we're always looking for something better than just perfect notes in time, in tune with a good sound. We're always searching for something that, that has that emotion behind it that you just can't get from anywhere else. And um, my good friend David Barnard, who who I recorded this album with, every time I play with him, it's always there. That emotion is always there, and it's like it doesn't matter what I do, even if I've never rehearsed anything, I can play anything I want whenever I want, and we're just always there together the whole time. So that was it was really special when because um, uh, we worked together when I was young and um, in Adelaide. And then he moved over to London for many years. And this album was something that I wanted to do for a long time because it was, it's all my, my dad's favorite arias um, mm. and favorite cornet solos from arias, um, which is why it's called the operatic trumpet. But I never had that complete gel with any other a pianist that I've ever worked with. And mm. I've worked with some amazing pianists and I really work well with them and we play great music, but that extra something just didn't uh, just doesn't exist there. And I don't know why it could be the friendship that I have with David and um, that comes out in our music or it, you know, it just can be the once in a lifetime kind of thing that happens to, to everyone. Um, but when he told me that he was moving back to Australia, that was the times like, yep, yeah, now's the time for us to get together. And we, and we put that album down and um, that was, it was brutal because I remember having the most epic flu that I've ever had that whole recording period. But it's like, no, nah, I have to drag myself out of bed because wow. at that time I was living in Sydney and David was living in Melbourne and my friend, Jared Gilson, who owns Oakland studios, he was the engineer behind it. I booked out the studio for the three days and I was in Melbourne. I was like, this is the only chance I've got to get this down. I have to do it now. So I'm like drugging up and getting out of bed and yeah, picking myself up to go and th go through and do it. But yeah, it's still a product that I'm, I'm really, really proud of. And um, that's really, that's really cool. Um, really happy with that one. I've actually just finished recording another album. Oh, fantastic. Uh, since this. Yeah. I've finished recording it. It's yet to be edited and mixed and mastered and all that sort of stuff. Um, but that one is actually because of Ictus. Um, so oh, cool. if anyone hasn't seen, um, seen the recording of the, of my entry, it's with a good friend of mine, Hugh Tidy, who plays mm -hmm. percussion. Um, and once again, we, we picked up and just played really well together and we were really happy with our product. And um, so when we actually surprisingly came out with a win, we were like, okay, how can we further this product and how can we, what can we do to better music from here? So we actually um, spent all of that money on commissioning some new works. So a composer in Melbourne, uh, Richard Linton, um, he's composed a new work for us and a Sydney based composer, Harry Strawling, um, so we've got two brand new works with, on this album. We've got um, the the Street Jam, which was the entry, and we've got a couple of other things on there as well, which um, 
which, yeah, so we're really proud of that. Um, it's just going through the mixing phase and we're trying to take our time with it instead of trying to rush it. So we recorded it. Um, and the plan was during the school holidays that have just been, we were going to get together and um, mix it and edit it so we could clear our heads and then come back with fresh ears. But with quarantine going on, uh, we kind of had other things that we needed to focus on. So that's probably going to wait till the next time we can get together. Okay. Mm. Uh, so just the, those, those watching uh, on Facebook, I've, I've commented in the uh, below the live stream, I, I've commented with links to the YouTube uh, version of operatic trumpet and the Spotify. Uh, so yeah. go give it a listen if you, if you want to. And I'm also going to yeah. just paste in now um, the street jam as well. Yeah, um, awesome. for, for those watching so you can you can give it a listen that, that was a really really cool piece um mm. uh, uh so going back i have several questions going backwards so mm. for like the first cd how, how long did it take you to prepare for that like how long were you like, there's stuff in there like napoli and uh yeah look norma that and, one's a bit, yeah look it's a bit of a funny one um so the preparation for that, so like the planning of what I wanted to record and and like those sorts of things, that actually took me like a good couple of years of planning, but not planning and practicing. It was planning of what story do I want to tell here? Um, there's a lot of albums that people do and it's like, oh yeah, I'll throw this and I'll throw that and I'll throw this. And the, the flow of the album doesn't really make uh, make any sense to me. And like all great recordings mm -hmm. and great playing and, you know, great pieces. Mm -hmm. um, but the flow doesn't like, I don't sit there and go, I want to listen to this whole album. And it's not really a done thing anymore with Spotify or the, the streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. People don't really listen to an album anymore, but mm -hmm. I actually released this just before Spotify hit. So, wow. um, which was a bit devastating because I've got a bunch of CDs here that <laughs> I've got to sell, but yeah, people are streaming now, but that's the time. So that's fine. Um, so I spent a good couple of years planning on, um, and I wanted to make sure that it, it was a bit of a tribute to my dad. So it was all stuff that he had in his library. Um, okay. so like every, everything except for there's a couple of things that I arranged for it. Um, the, um, like the, on with the motley, the, um, the eternal source of love divine, um, those kinds of things, um, that were rearranged for this, the Rasulkas, um, I had a different arrangement of it. Um, but David and I actually thought we would put it back into the original key rather than the Eric Wilson arrangement, which was the one we were going to do. But after playing through that, um, literally the week before we both decided to rearrange it and put it back into the original key of G flat and okay. recorded in G flat. Um, so yeah, so that it was, it was a couple of years in the process of planning um, but as far as practice goes, um, well, I was actually at recruit school for the Navy for um, February, March, uh, February and March. And then I came back from there um, where I didn't really get to play trumpet at all. And then um, I basically started when I came back at the end of March um, and worked through till June. And then we were recording in June. Okay. Mm. that's it it's amazing uh and then going uh uh to street jam the piece that you submitted for for ictus uh yeah how did you um it's, it's a like how did you find that composer and the relationship with the percussionist uh you, you touched on a little bit well um i actually found a recording i think it's eric um I can't think of his last name right now, um, but his website's American Trumpet Player. And he actually recorded an, an album of just trumpet and percussion, which mm -hmm. was um, uh, End of Matter, I think the, the name of the album is. And I found that just through streaming, through, like, um, through Spotify, and I found that album and I really dug, I really enjoyed that whole album, actually. I thought it was really well done. Mm -hmm. I thought it was good to have interesting music. Um, and the Street Jam really... Uh, really spoke to me because it was it was different um, okay. it was it was kind of what I call blip blot music but it had groove to it as well where I, I can't like I really struggle with things like um, exposed throat for argument's sake as much as mm -hmm. I love it and I think 
it's an amazing piece of music. I struggle to relate to that because it's just so out there and like, I don't find anything to cling to, but the street jam, it has all that blip blops kind of stuff, which is really cool. And, but then it goes into that groove and, um, like it's got that groove, yeah, that groove oh. just keeps going through. And, and then, um, as far as putting it together, I, I listened to it and I was like, that's something I really want to do. I bought the music, um, and just kind of brushed over it. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to find a percussionist to do this with one day. And, um, I was booked to do a, um, it's kind of a brass ensemble concert and we we're doing some Granger for the, for the concert. And we booked a piano player. So we a few of us from the group are going to, we're going to play some solos as well. But sadly the, um, the, the piano player with about a week's notice, she actually got quite sick and couldn't do the gig. So she pulled out a, a week before. Mm-hmm. So we're doing this spontaneous uh, guys, the piano player is sick. Can someone, has anyone got anything that they can play? And I was like, well, and my buddy Hugh was on the gig and I spoke to him and said, Hey, look, do you want to learn this? I've got this piece. And he's like, yeah, let's do it. So we actually got that together in four days and performed that live um, at that brass ensemble concert. And we were really happy with it. We worked really, really hard to get that up because it's a lot of work in that. Like there's multiphonics, there's quite a lot, quite a big range in there as well. There's, compound times and complex rhythms and Mm -hmm. cross rhythms and polymetrics going on. It was really challenging to get together. Um, And when we did it and we came off that stage thinking like feeling really good about that performance, we were like, this is awesome. So when we saw the, um, or when I found the um, advertisement, my brother actually sent it through to me from Instagram. I think Um, the first thing I thought was I want to play street jam for this. So we um and it was only i think we performed it in december and then i think we recorded the audition in april actually it was about the 20th of april so while i was on long service leave actually um with my yeah with my my boy so i wasn't actually practicing a great deal um because i didn't have much time i had a had a two and a half year old girl and a a newborn boy at home mm-hmm. so I needed to be dad. So Mm -hmm. um, it was, I literally entered that competition with 30 minutes of practice seven days a week. (laughs) Wow. That's it. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Uh, And prior to that, like um, when you're, when you were playing a lot in the military, but what, what is your, I don't know, like your daily routine or how, how much did you practice? I know it probably changed over the years, but. Yeah, that's changed massively. I, um, traditionally, I'm a big practicer. I, I love practicing and it's the sort of thing where like my parents put a curfew on my practice. Um, like I wasn't allowed to practice after 7.30 at night. And what ended up happening was we'd come home from school and work and my parents would race as quickly as they possibly could to get dinner on the table because they knew that once dinner was on the table, I had to stop practicing because it was going to be dinner and then I had to do the dishes and then it was after 7.30 so I couldn't practice anymore. (laughs) So there was a bit of a race on to see how much practice I could get done before curfew. Um, And then when I joined the military, so um, in the army band, their their daily routine is like at 8.30 to 3.30 kind of thing, but they also do their gigs on top of that. So um, depending on the band, you'd do your warm up at, at eight thirty, or sometimes you'd do like uh, you'd have some physical training at like first thing. Some bands start at seven thirty and go through to th- three thirty. It depends on where you're at, but normally you'd have a bit of private practice in the morning. You'd have an ensemble rehearsal from about ten o'clock till twelve o'clock would be the main ensemble, okay. and then one till one thirty at one till two thirty would be your smaller group. So you'd have your big band, your brass on your brass ensemble, your brass quintets, those kind of things would be your traditional or your typical daily routine if there weren't any gigs on. Um, but then you'd obviously have your gigs, your gigs would take priority on top of that. Okay. Mm. and what are um maybe some of the things that you getting more trumpet specific what are some of the things that you like your your bread and butter of practicing or your routine and some people are standing Uh, or slot you know know, i i really love the clark 
book. Okay. Um, the Clark book is one of my favorites. The Sloshberg book is another favorite. Um, I try to change it up though. Um, because I discovered a, a few years ago that I was developing what I call show chops where I can play these things really, really well. But if I try and change one note in that pattern, then it just falls apart kind of thing. So I could play Clark two really well and I'd, I'd get to a brick wall and like, this is as fast as I can do. And I'd, I'd feel really good about it. But then if I did the inverted version that Vizzuti does in his technical mm -hmm. book one, I'd completely fall apart. I'm like, it's the same thing. So now what I try to do instead of, um, instead of thinking about what exercises I'm going to play, I try thinking about what I'm trying to achieve okay. with my practice session. So if I'm trying to achieve um, stronger valves for argument's sake, I will try to change up which exercise I'm doing and I'll choose exercises that are going to challenge my valves for me to do that and then i'll i'll do you know like a week of i'll do you know like the visuti book for argument's sake i'll do his exercise one um sort of thing on his valves and i'll do that for a week and i'll get that as good as i can in the week and then next week it'll be exercise two for argument's sake or i'll okay. change same thing with flexibilities um you know they're a big one as well that i definitely need to improve on so i'll work through some flexibilities from you know i might do the nut holder one week sort of thing do a week of his exercises the next week i'll do sloshberg the week after i'll do um bin lay or the week after i might do um uh you know jimmy stamp kind of thing or you know just i just try to think about what my end goal is with the exercises okay and then i try and rotate through them so i don't get what i call show chops okay cool mm. um and uh I wanted to go back and touch too. We, we, we started with the online teaching. So, and, and performance. So uh, you left the Navy band. It was how long ago now about, was it a year ago or? Uh, yeah, it's about 18 months ago now. Yeah. 18 months. Okay. And, uh, and you did a recital and, and, and you, you've done sort of like the entrepreneurial thing. So you're teaching and you're, and you're gigging and putting all, mm. all this together. Could you just talk a little bit about that? Um, the process and, and, yeah. Um, so I uh, like the, with the online thing or with the, um, face to face thing, uh, online face to face, uh, gigs and just sort of how you, you network and, and make things happen. Yeah. Well, um, to be honest, gigs last year in my first year out of the Navy gigs were a little bit lean, uh, for mm -hmm. me. Um, now part of that was, um, part of that was I was trying to establish enough teaching to essentially pay rent um, okay. because I knew that I needed to have something consistent. Um, okay. And I was also, uh, I was also kind of discovering who I was as a teacher because I'd never done huge amounts of teaching. It was just a side thing that I did to, to give back to some, to kids that wanted some help sort of thing. Um, and like I'd have them long term, but I never had more than five students at a time. Mm -hmm. And so it was a big change for me to, to go back to, or to go into teaching and teaching in a school is very different to teaching privately as well. Mm. I, suddenly I have to find, um, I have to find ways to have a kid who kind of likes playing trumpet and I need to find a way to get them motivated and get them to want to practice. So that was a big part of what I was doing last year. Um, and okay. trying to automate, um, Automate admin is such a huge thing. Um, when I was in the military bands, there was next to no admin. It was rare that I had to do admin um, kind of thing. And when I did, it was never a huge amount or it's like a week of admin and I'd, I was done for a month. And that was partly my rank. Um, now, when I started teaching, as, as you'd know, there's a lot of admin. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of yeah. admin. And that's like, there's from invoicing, there's, you know, like finding you know, cataloging your music. Like I never thought I'd need to catalog my music because I just thought oh, I'll open up my filing cabinet, choose something out of there and play it. But now I actually have to think, you know, what standard is my student at? What can they play? That kind of thing. So I spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, and so, you know, my first year, there wasn't a great deal of gigs uh, for me, but then I started to, once I got myself comfortable with my teaching and I was happy with where that was at, then I started to work on my, I've got a brass quintet, um, Outback Brass. 
and we started to do some things, um, just some carnival kind of things and some fairs and um, fates and that sort of thing, um, working through that. And then I started to work towards getting uh, back into recitals because recitals is where I mm-hmm. feel the most comfortable. It's what I like doing the most. Um, and so I just, um, I've got a church that I go to that's relatively local to me. And um, I just, you know, a friend of mine who I was teaching with and it's like, Hey, look, do you want to play? Do you want to play together? And he's like, yeah, sure. Let's do it. Um, and then I just kind of try to, promote to people who I think might be interested, share what I'm doing. Um, and then, you know, pr- while you're practicing, you're promoting and hope that when you get to the gig that people turn up to cover costs, really. <laughs> yeah. That, that's amazing. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I, I like uh, how, how you talked about, you know, thinking about uh, how to motivate your students. Uh, um, mm. and, and, uh, all the admin behind it. And I think students may not realize how much teachers think about the student needs to play this and the student needs to do that too. Yeah. 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 I, I totally agree. And um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because you, if you're passionate about it, you, well, if you're passionate about something, it kind of doesn't leave your mind. It's, Mm -hmm. it's an obsession. Um, And it's always there and you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, Oh, I should get that piece for that student. And then (laughs) you you get out, get up out of bed, go to the filing cabinet, grab it out of the filing cabinet, put it in my bag because (laughs) otherwise I'll forget about it sort of thing, you know? Um, But yeah, there's that kind of thing. And um, just choosing, choosing repertoire. So I guess if there are any students listening to this, um, don't feel like your teacher is against you. Um, your teacher actually wants to help you. And one thing that some of my students have done um, and still do is they don't want to give me any, anything about themselves. They don't want to give me any character. They don't want to tell me what they're interested in. All of those things. We're not trying to form a case against you. We're actually trying to find out what you like so that we can try to relate to you as a person And so that we can find music that you want to play. Um, If, you know, like if you want to play football themes, tell us, we're we're happy to work on football themes with you, you know, like, (laughs) or I am, you know, Um, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll meet you in the middle. We can do some technical work and we can play football themes, you know, and like, I've got students who do that, that that their only interest is, you know, they want to play football themes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've got a student in his sixties who, he wanted to take up trumpet so that he could play at his daughter's wedding. That's it. You know, wow. in his sixties, like, I just want to play at my daughter's wedding. I want to play three tunes at my daughter's wedding. I'm like, mm-hmm. great. And now he's actually getting paid. Well, up until coronavirus, he was getting paid to play at other people's weddings too. And he's wow. loving it. That's awesome. That's so really awesome. yeah, I guess that's one of my big tips for, for younger students, especially, you know, you, you, you know, if there's any tu- teacher out there that you can talk to and try to, you know, answer these questions to, it's going to be your music tutor because we're not trying to build a case against you. We're trying to help uh, relate to you so that we can get you um, what you want out of music. Fantastic. Even more so if your parents are making you do it. <laughs> well, I think that's amazing too for translating to maybe our careers are, are, your career now as uh, doing recitals that, you know, mm. a lot of times we, we do certain jobs and we just do sort of what we have to do, or we go to school and we check the boxes and we do the repertoire, we do the recitals, we pass the music history exams, we pass the, all of this, that, and the other. And then at a certain point, you know, what is it that you want to do? And I think it's amazing that you're, you know, doing recitals now, which is what you mm. want to do. Um, yeah. And f- exploring, that option uh when it comes to picking your repertoire for your recitals um or finding new repertoire how do you what is that process like do you just listen to a lot of people or yeah i do i do do a lot of listening um so usually i do i'm probably one of the rare guys who actually listens to a lot of trumpet playing um so you know like hawkan's always been a favorite of mine and has been um i should come back to that story actually since I first heard him play 
And so, but there are other guys out there that I really enjoy their playing, like Sergei Nikolayakov, you know, just phenomenal technique. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Alison Balsam, Alan Vizzuti as well, um, Joey Perro, um, Pacho Flores. You know, there's so many phenomenal players out there, and they're phenomenally, they're phenomenal technically, but they also tell stories. Um, you know, never do I listen to any of those guys play anything and not understand something kind of vibe. So um, I kind of listen with my emotions first. Mm-hmm. Um, what do I feel from listening to, to them? So I'm not listening for technical facility. I'm not listening for um, range. I'm not listening for circular breathing. I'm not listening for um, key or harmonics or harmonic structure. Or, I don't listen for any of that sort of stuff initially. I'm listening for what emotion does it give me? Mm -hmm. Um, And then I go from there. And then once it kind of, once I connect with it emotionally, then I start to to kind of get deeper with it. Um, So when it comes to picking a recital work, I will usually try, like I'm listening to a lot of music and I'll find a major work that I really relate to. Mm -hmm. Um, So for argument's sake with the the album that I've just recorded street jam was the piece that I've like the major work, which I've built everything around. So I chose it because I had that emotional connection with street jam, you know, that the groove just really got to me. So I, when I, um, when I perform it in the recital, I'll choose that. And obviously I've got the limitation of, I now have to choose a full recital of trumpet and percussion gear. Now, this one's actually a lot more complicated than that because it's like, okay, what percussion instruments does my percussionist have? Cause there is a never ending. Like we wanted to put heptide on the, on this mm-hmm. album. Um, but I think we needed like three different tune tam tams and like, we just weren't going to be able to get them realistically. Mm-hmm. So that, that one didn't happen. Um, but you know, so like if I'm choosing, um, Let's go. Uh, so my last recital, I think it was um, the Hubo Sonata was my major work that I chose. Okay. So, you know, I, I love that piece. It's one of my favorites. Um, so I chose that as my major work. Then I also go, all right, I want a, an opener and I want a finish it. Um, and um, I can't even remember what my opener was. Or I might have even opened with um, the Hubo. I can't remember. But I'll choose an opener and a finisher. Usually I like them to be making a statement. Mm-hmm. Um, so slavish fantasy for argument's sake, uh, is one of my favorite finishes. It's okay. also one of my favorite openers, but usually I try to finish with it. Um, I'll also want something melodic, you know, I want to mm-hmm. target the heartstrings. So I'll choose something that will do that. So usually quite a, you know, half of my opera album, you know, okay. is, you know, heartstring tuggers kind of thing. Um, I'll also pick my audience if i'm going to be playing to the gray rinse then it'll be a lot of that kind of stuff that you know they relate to there'll be andrew lloyd weber there'll be toe tappers there'll be that sort of thing okay. um, if i'm playing to a serious classical kind of environment then those sorts of things will be put put aside um but i like to start with something that's um energetic fast um a little bit technical or something that sounds harder than it is so it might be a theme and variation kind of vibe And then I like to start a journey. So I like to kind of tell, um, go through and start to challenge the listener and get through to something that is very challenging to listen to. So street jam is something that's very challenging to listen to. The Tomasi um, is something that's very challenging to listen to. Some Charlia might be, um, might be challenging to listen to for some people. And then once I've challenged the listener with that, um, which is usually the major work, I then come out of that with something that's easy to listen to and then finish with something that's quite showy as well. Um, but once again, um, a positive vibe and an experience that way. So start with a positive, take them through a journey, which might um, target the heartstrings, challenge them emotionally, challenge them musically, and then finish off with a with a smile kind of thing. Fantastic, fantastic. Mm-hmm. And what is your? You said you had a Hogan story earlier. Ah, uh, um, so yeah, so early on in my high school, um, 
no, this is how I was intru- introduced to, to Hawkins music. And um, there was um, at the time I was year eight or nine or something. And um, it was three weeks before a, a music competition, a solo brass band solo competition. And I was competing in the opens for the first time ever. And um, I, ha- I didn't know what I was going to play. I had two or three pieces of like, I could play this and I could play that. And, but I didn't really know um, what to play. And my brothers, like I was talking to my brother about it, um, my older brother, and he's dusted off, like this was when the dual DVD combo VHS players were, were a thing. And he's dusted off this old VHS tape and it's Hawkan playing at the art gallery with Christian Lindbergh. Oh, that's an amazing. And oh, yeah. everyone knows it. Yeah. Classic thing. And from, from watching that, like we watched that, we watched that whole VHS, you know, from the start, I think it starts with the force of destiny and um, goes through that. And, and then when Hawkan got to Norma, you know, out of the back of the ovens. Mm-hmm. Um, I was so blown away. Like, and at the time I saw myself as a corner player more than a trumpet player. Um, but I watched him play and just have this, this unique, beautiful cornet sound that I'd, that I'd never heard. And this controlled vibrato that was very different to the, the English vibrato that we were trying to emulate here in Australia. And mm-hmm. um, the, the story that he told and like the technique that he had. And um, it just, from then on listening to him at that, at the art gallery playing Norma, um, I've been one of Hawkins biggest fans, I guess. Um, Yeah. I listen to everything he's got. Um, Yeah. um, At the beach would probably be my favorite album of his, um, especially the Slavonic, uh, Slavish fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. I'm also a huge Hokan Hokan fan. Uh, and it, have you been watching his uh, the the weekly Charlie etudes that he's? Yeah, I've seen a couple of them, but um, yeah, I I need to uh, set up notifications so that yeah. it keeps telling me that they're there. Yeah. I think he's only done two so far. Um, yeah. Hopefully, the yeah. quarantine doesn't go along go on long enough to get through all of them. Uh, yeah, I did say the um, I did see the the um, the horn hangouts um, <laughs> that he did where they had almost every trumpet player like, all the legends on live and and he was telling us about the story and he's like i hope this doesn't go on too long because uh, there's some gnarly ones in here yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah um he, he he's incredible I, mm. and uh th- that's just it's 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 great to hear about that like the inspiration of finding you know the an album or a player. And I, I remember I had a teacher in high school who used to make for me um, every week, he would just, uh, and it was back before Spot, uh, Spotify and all of this. So he would just take records. He had all these records and he would burn them onto CDs and I would listen to the CD and he's like, you think you're good? Go listen to this. And, <laughs> and every week I was just like blown away, you know, ever, you know, from like Bill Chase yeah. to Cat Anderson. To, back in your place pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this this has been fantastic, um, and I I want to uh, maybe just ask a few more questions uh, before yeah. we wrap up. And and one of them would be you know, and this is this is just an open ended thing. But you know, where do you see? I don't know. Coming out of this quarantine, like the place of music, what what do you see happening? Or you may not have an yeah. answer, to that, but <laughs> it's. Uh... Look, this is a tough one. Um, there can, it can, I can see it going one of two ways. Now, in Australia, we've, we're very um, fortunate. We've been affected way less than, than a lot of other countries in the world. And we're very fortunate that, um, that our, um, our isolation started very quickly and we were able to, to kind of nip it in the bud pretty mm-hmm. quickly. Um, to to be perfectly honest, I kind of see it being a bit of a downturn for a while. Um, I just feel like, um, and like, yeah, it might be a bit of a negative kind of thing, but I don't necessarily feel like people are going to be 
able to earn the same amount of money because I don't think people are going to be able to pay the same amount of money mm. to do this. The economic cri um, crisis that goes with the pandemic um, has really is really hitting hard. Um, yeah. And it's not just musicians that are being hit hard. It's, it's people of all, of, of all careers really, you know, like my, my wife up until this pandemic worked in travel and now she's now unemployed. Um, so, and she's not the only person like, you know, people who work for airlines, you know, they've mm -hmm. been affected. Like the, I don't, I don't think there are many industries that aren't affected in some way. Mm -hmm. Now, because of that, I feel like it's going to take a while for everyone to come back to spending, to be able to spend the money that they want to. So I think it's going to take a bit of time for us to get back to, you know, I was earning a hundred bucks for this gig last year this year it's going to be 50 and I think yeah. it's going to be that way for a little while. So I think we need to be creative with how we're going to um, support ourselves after this mm -hmm. pandemic. Um, and I think it's, I think it's kind of our responsibility to help look after each other as well. Um, as musicians, we are musicians, biggest fans um, kind of thing. So mm -hmm. things like go and listen to, to other people's albums on Spotify, like, um, or YouTube music or, you know, or Apple music or, or any of the streaming platforms. I, the, the business of music now, it's, it's a fan based thing. Now it's not a, an album selling thing anymore. It's you mm -hmm. know, like you sell an album and like, I mean, there's a, there's a $3 margin in my albums. I sell one album, I make $3 per disc sort of thing. It's, it's not a big margin there. Um, but by building a fan base of people who regularly listening to each other's music, that is where, um, I feel like the music industry is really going, um, in the future. And just by spending a little bit of time listening to someone else's music, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, you listen to one person's album one time that then tells Spotify or, or any other streaming platform that, you're interested in that music, which will then open you up to listen to other people's music as well. But it'll also tell Spotify that that's something that people want to listen to. So it'll turn up in other people's news feeds as well. So uh, I, I really feel like that's kind of a big way forward for us. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like musicians want handouts. I think we want to work and I feel like mm -hmm. we want to, we, we, we treasure our craft so I think now's the time we need to, to kind of support each other. We need to go and watch each other's YouTube channels sort of thing. Um, yeah. Because even though there's, you know, like it's something like a dollar per thousand minutes of, of watch time, if you're yeah. lucky enough to be monetized. Um, but by you, by, by watching someone's channel one time or watching one video one time, that then triggers algorithms for other people to see that as well. And I think that's mm -hmm. where it's going to go. And I think that's where we need to, to go um, in future um, kind of thing. Yeah. Fantastic. I, I think it's a, it's an incredible time. Right. Well, it's scary, um, but it's incredible. The connections that are being made. Um, you know, I founded ICTUS to make competing internationally more accessible, um, without travel cost or without visas. Uh, I grew up yeah. pretty poor. Um, and, and some things for me were just out of reach. Um, mm -hmm. And now I see there's just so much online right now. Um, and mm -hmm. if you're a student or even a professional, like I, I'm learning every day, I just spend, you know, I set aside a certain amount of time and there's just so much out there right now. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, it's, uh, Ed Carroll, one of our, our judges uh, who runs Chosenvale, has, has repeatedly said that he's interested to see the art that's going to come out of this period um, because yeah. we haven't really experienced anything like this in, in our lifetimes. Mm. Um, and I, I think back to, you know, like, you know, Leningrad Symphony by Shostakovich, like this, mm. the musicians are starving and here they are making this music. And I'm wondering, you know, what is going to come out of this with poetry and music mm -hmm. and compositions and uh but yeah. speaking of 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 youtube channels i have a link down to your your youtube channel so if you're watching this please check out phil's channel um and when we finish the interview i'm gonna I'll put a link to your website down in the comments as well yeah, awesome. so check out his website uh, if you're a young student you want to take a lesson 
you can look him up there and you can, you can get a, a lesson. Um, and if you're interested in the, our competition, uh, we're open again. Uh, the application is going to open on May 8th. Um, and the deadline's in the middle of July. Um, and you just visit www.trumpetcompetition.org. Um, and uh, is there anything else you, you want to add, Phil? Or Yeah, look, um, what I'll do is, um, I'm just pulling it up on my other screen now, is um, for those of you who are actually interested, as I mentioned earlier, I, um, when, I, when I entered the competition, I was only practicing for 30 minutes a day. And that's not 30 minutes on my piece. That was my total practice time kind of thing. And what I've actually done is I've put together how I structured my practice. Um, oh, fantastic. As, a, as a as a free guide so i'll flick that through to you as well um it's just a free pdf download and you can check out how i actually structured um my practice to be efficient um and get what i needed to get done and achieve what i needed to achieve um in that that shorter space of time really is that a is that a link on your website then or is it a um yeah i'm just pulling it up here i'll send it to you so you can upload it it's all through my youtube a lot of my youtube videos okay as well um but i'll give it to you right now i'll give it to you on facebook that's probably the easiest uh yeah let me let me get over there now let's see if i can Tell you what, I'm now working on two screens. I've never worked on two screens before. It's something, it's pretty new to me, but my productivity is so much better on two screens. Have you ever done that before? Yeah, I, I, I my full-time gig is a, um, I, I run a community music school and I, and I have two screens constantly because I'm just in spreadsheets. Although mm. you were talking about the admin of teaching earlier and I completely yeah. understand that's a, uh, I'm a full-time admin. Um, mm. Yeah. Cool. That's in your Facebook now. All right. I'm waiting for it now. All right. Cool. And that's just a free PDF. Like, yeah, check it out. It's, it's just how, what I did um, to achieve what I, what I needed to achieve um, and how I structured it. So it wasn't a, I need to achieve everything in one day. I broke it down so that over the course of the whole week, I was getting everything done in the week and improving every week from there. Fantastic. So just slowing down the slowing down the improvement, but that's going to happen when you're going from five to six hours of practice a day down to 30 minutes. So, um, but you know, it's, it's one of those things that at some point you kind of have to decide, right. I need to sacrifice. Um, I need to sacrifice trumpet for, for life at some point, you know, now I'm, it's good. I'm back to, I'm back to my, my normal two hours of practice and I'm, you know, I'm strong, I'm feeling great. Um, but there's going to be times where life just needs to take over and I'm going to be going straight back to my 30 minute structure. And, you know, even my two hour structures based on the same kind of thing, I just extend everything. Um, but you know, it's, <laughs> when it's, when it's lifetime, it's going to be lifetime. When it's, when it's work time, it's work time, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that, um, it doesn't mean that I'm any less, uh, obsessed or, um, passionate about, about trumpet. I'm still thinking about it. I just don't physically have the horn on my face for more than that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. And did you, is it broken? I, I, I put the link there in, in the Facebook, but I can't pull it up right now while I'm, while I'm chatting, but did you, did you yeah. break it? Uh, did you, do you break it down by like with a timer or numbers? Yeah. Of so like okay. I would actually set a timer. So um, there's actually a YouTube video on my channel that I've done, which is um, I think it's like the best app on my phone or something, the best app for productivity or something like that, where mm -hmm. I'll actually set a timer and, and go. So for argument's sake, if I, if I want to work on tonguing and fast tonguing, I will just like, it'll be scales. It'll be based on like the, you know, just semi quavers um, or 16th notes as you guys call them. And mm -hmm. I'll set the timer going and I'll just go around the cycle and I'll be doing semi quavers nonstop. It, pretty much like what you see in the, um, the stamp book sort of thing. Um, and I'll change that up. So one day I'll start at the bottom and work my way up. And the next time I'll start at the top and work my way down. And um, I'll set a timer for 
um, however long I need to that day on that kind of thing. And then once the timer goes off, it's time to move on to something else. And I also find that's really good because it means that I know when I'm finishing so mm -hmm. I can stay concentrating the whole time. And it's also good for endurance because um, like if I'm working Clark too, for argument's sake, um, I don't stop. Like I start at the bottom and I just keep going and I don't take any rest. So I put myself through what I call short-term fatigue, which um, kind of ends up improving my long-term fatigue because I, I figure out how to play. So, you know, when I first start coming back into shape, I might only get one octave sort of thing and then I'm chopped out and you take a little rest. But then by the time I'm in good form, I know that I can start at the low G and then finish at the G above the stave or, you know, or even the next up octave up or, you know, however far. So, um, and there's minimal rest in that sort of thing. So um, I just find that's really productive to improve every aspect of my playing, even with just a short amount of time. That's awesome. That's really cool that you mentioned this too, because I just watched yesterday, there was a master class with Tom Hooten, principal of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. And he shared the same, same thing where there was an app with a bunch of timers where he had each exercise that he had to do like breathing for one minute and then like rest and then like, you know, play this for two minutes and then rest. Mm. And even the rest was timed. It was amazing. Yeah, um, I haven't got that far through it. I'm, I'm about, you know, 10 minutes into that and then I had to stop. But yeah, okay. I'll continue watching that later on. Uh, it's, it's amazing. I, I, I need to get more of that discipline in my practice myself. I'll have to, I'll have to check out your, your, uh, your timing here and, and uh, yeah. it's hard it's it's hard mentally as well because it's um it's hard to be that honest with yourself that you're actually going to improve um and it's it's easy to beat yourself up when you're being overly or when you're being very critical of your playing to try and improve it as much as you can in the smallest amount of time um it's yeah, you need to be able to find an outlet to kind of release because at no point do you actually play stuff or practice stuff that you can actually play. It's all about stuff that you can't play and figuring out how to play it and doing it rapidly. You know, um, you don't cool. have time to mess around. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, you know, no point in playing lit harmonic slurs from C to G in like below the stave at you know, like real at really slowly. If you can do that every day, there's, you know, do the stuff you can't do. Practice the stuff you can't practice, like you can't play. Don't play the stuff you can all the time. Very cool. Mm. And that, I think it relates to, to maybe to, to anything outside of music, um, you know, and, and trying to do things, you know, in order to do something. I, I, I don't know who the quote is, but in order to do something that you've never, or in order to get something you've never had, you must be willing to do something that you've never tried before. Um, yeah, yeah. And I was yeah. I was in a seminar a few weeks back with uh, Innosight, which is a global innovation firm, uh, and they had this thing called future back thinking, which is where you set your vision where you want to be in ten years, and then you you slowly implement that into pieces. Um, and so for for me, like live streaming, this was a, a a huge. I had you know all these little things I had to figure out how to you know equipment to order the microphone, the interface, and. YouTube. And every time I got something, I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. Now I don't know how to do this. And, and even this morning at 6am, I'm up watching YouTube videos, trying to figure out how to get sound with my video. Um, yeah. And, and yeah. 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 One of those things. Um, but um, I guess the, uh, one of my favorite quotes, now you're bringing up quotes. One of my favorite quotes is from actually um, Michael Jordan and it's get the fundamentals down and everything will fall into place. Yeah, it's such That's a amazing. good quote, you know, um, you know, I, I'm not even a basketball fan, like, but you know, Michael Jordan was such a, such an amazing player and such an amazing person that he's, mm -hmm. he's a star over here. And, you know, even amongst people who like myself who don't follow the basketball, but you know, getting the fundamentals down, you know, like it, you can, you can achieve anything if your fundamentals are good, you know, and it's one of my, one of my past teachers, um, Tristram Williams, who was oh, yeah. principal trumpet of the Melbourne symphony at 21 or 22, like ridiculously young age. Um, he, he drilled me on fundamentals and he said to me, 
like I remember him saying to me, your flexibility suck, right? You need to fix them. It's like, it's like a, an artist having to paint the most amazing, beautiful painting, but mm-hmm. there's a big red dot in the middle of the canvas, you know, fix your flexibility, this kind of thing. And like, since then it's just been like, okay, fundamentals, fix them. So I can do anything I want to do when I need to do it sort of thing. That's awesome. How, how long did you, how many years did you study with, with Tristram? Uh, not long at all, actually. Um, I kind of had, I had about six or seven lessons total with him. Okay. Um, but you know, like the lessons with him were two or three hours kind of thing each time he'd, um, at the sta- at the time I was living regionally, um, and I would travel to Melbourne and have a three hour lesson with him and then go home and just feel like I should quit. <laughs> Um, and then but keep working on all the stuff and then when I felt like I got a handle on everything he he taught me I went back for more punishment and then you know kept coming back sort of thing and that that was over about uh, about seven or eight months and I had about had about six or seven lessons from him um but yeah he was pretty yeah he's all over it yeah he's he's incredible it was he was on the faculty at the last time I went to Chosenville, I think in 2010, he was on the faculty and he gave this recital uh, playing Stockhausen and it was, it was incredible. I mean, he's just yeah. like out of this, out of this world. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Hogan, him. actually, uh, at Chosenville, Hogan would get up, at, 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 he would do these morning warm ups at like 7 a.m. or something uh, in the shed there and, you know, just figure it out. Same thing with Marcus Stockhausen. It's, it's incredible. Uh, so do, when you were young, if you were like when your dad was teaching you, mm. um, did, he, did you do a lot of fundamentals then too? Or, uh, was yeah, it- so pretty much. Um, so like we were, um, we, we were pretty like, we weren't very well off when I was young. So my older brother would always get lessons from, um, from one of the guys from the symphony orchestra and then all of the technical stuff that he was given, my dad would then copy that from my brother's book and give it to me and then, <laughs> you know, work with me on that sort of thing. So, you know, so we're doing like mouthpiece buzzing out of the stamp from young, okay. um, working on uh, the Louis Davidson book, actually, believe it or not. Um, fantastic book. Um, you know, I still keep coming back to that every time, you know, if I, you know, so like um, in the military band, we'd always have like a four week summer break. Um, and most of those I'd put the trumpet in its case for two, to t- two weeks, refresh and then come back. And it's always the Davidson that I come back with. Um, it's just something about it that it just really works. I think it, it might be because it's kind of broken into like he breaks into the series. So it's like you work through your range G down your C sort of thing. And you get all of that working well and, and you get the air flowing there and the valves flowing nicely. Then you extend your range a little bit and you work all of that. And, you know, I think it, something to do with that. I don't know. I, I don't know how it works. I just put it on my face and blow and, and it, it kind of comes <laughs> out. Awesome. This, this, well, this, this is really fantastic. Uh, and I, I appreciate you taking the time. It's the evening there, uh, morning here. Um, mm. And yeah, coming up to have, 11 now. So past my bedtime. Yeah. Uh, if, if you haven't heard Phil before, you know, please check out the links down, uh, down in the comments um and definitely give his um his entry uh street jam from the 2018 competition to listen it's 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 really fun um and if you're interested in our competition we hope to hear your tape from wherever you are in the world this year